England, the 7th century CE, two centuries after the Romans left, missionaries return to pagan Britannia. Churches are built. People convert. Many Christian monks document this moment, but none record it like the father of English history, the Venerable Bede. How did the gospel spread throughout England? What was it like after the Romans? Find out. Read the ecclesiastical history of the English people. The Ecclesiastical History of the English People Chapter 1 Of the Situation of Britain and Ireland and of Their Ancient Inhabitants Britain, an island in the ocean formerly called Albion, is situated between the north and west facing, though at a considerable distance, the coast of Germany, France, and Spain, which form the greatest part of Europe. It extends 800 miles in length towards the north and is 200 miles in breadth, except where several promontories extend further in breadth, by which its compass is made to be 3,675 miles. To the south, as you pass along the nearest shore of the Belgic Gaul, the first place in Britain which opens to the eye is the city of Rutubi Portis, by the English corrupted into Reptisester. The distance from hence across the sea to Gasoricum, the nearest shore of the Marini, is 55 miles, or as some writers say, 450 furlongs. On the back of the island, where it opens up upon the boundless ocean, it has the islands called Orcades. Britain excels for grain and trees and is well adapted for feeding cattle and beasts of burden. It also produces vines in some places and has plenty of land and waterfowls of several sorts. It is remarkable also for rivers abounding in fish and plentiful springs. It has the, gr the greatest plenty of salmon and eels. Eels are also frequently taken and dolphins as also whales. Besides many sorts of shellfish, such as mussels, and which are often found excellent pearls of all colors, red, purple, violet, and green, but mostly white. There's also a great abundance of cockles, of which the scarlet dye is made, a most beautiful color which never fades with the heat of the sun or the washing of the rain, but the older it is, the more beautiful it becomes. It has both salt and hot springs, and from them flow rivers, which furnish hot baths, proper for all ages and sexes, and arranged according. For water, at St. Basil says, receives the heating quality when it runs along certain metals and becomes not only hot, but scalding. Britain has also many veins of metals as copper, iron, lead, and silver, it has much an excellent jet, which is black and sparkling, glitter, glittering at the fire, and when heated, drives away serpents. Being warmed with rubbing, it holds fast whatever is applied to, like amber. The island was formerly embellished with 28 noble cities. Besides innumerable castles, which were all strongly secured with walls, towers, gates, and locks, and... From its lying almost under the North Pole, the nights are light in summer, so that at midnight the beholders are often in doubt whether the evening twilight still continues or that of the morning is coming on, for the sun in the night returns under the earth through the northern regions at no great distance from them. For this reason, the days are of great length in summer, as on the contrary, the nights are in winter, for the sun then withdraws into the southern parts so that the nights are 18 hours long. Thus, the nights are extraordinarily short in summer and the days in winter, that is, of only six equino equinoctial hours. 
Whereas in Armenia, Macedonia, Italy, and other countries of the same latitude, the longest day or night extends but to 15 hours, and the shortest to nine. This island at present, following the number of the books in which the divine law was written, contains five nations, the English, Britons, Scots, Picts, and Latins, each in its own peculiar dialect, cultivating the sublime study of divine truth. The Latin tongue is, by the study of the scriptures, become common to all the rest. At first, this island had no other inhabitants, but the Britons, from who it derived its name, and who, coming over into Britain, as is reported from Arm- Arm- Armorica, possessed themselves of the southern parts thereof. When they, beginning at the south, had made themselves masters of the greatest part of the island, it happened that the nation of the Picts, from Scythia, as is reported, putting to the sea in a few long ships, were driven by the winds beyond the shores of Britain, and arrived on the northern coast of Ireland, where, finding the nation of the Scots, they begged to be allowed to settle among them, but could not succeed in obtaining their request. Ireland is the greatest island next to Britain and lies to the west of it, but as it is shorter than Britain to the north. So on the other hand, it runs far beyond it to the south, opposite to the northern parts of Spain, though a spacious sea lies between them. The Picts, as has been said, arriving in this island by sea, desired to have a place granted them in which they might settle. The Scots answered that the island could not contain them both, but we can give you good advice, said they. What to do? We know there is another island not not far from ours to the eastward, which we often see at a distance, when the days are clear. If you will go hither, you will obtain settlements, or if they should oppose you, you shall have our assistance. The Picts, accordingly sailing over into Britain, began to inhabit the northern parts thereof, for the Britons were possessed of the southern. Now the Picts had no wives, and asked them of the Scots, who would not consent to grant them upon any other terms than that when any difficulty should arise, they should choose a king from the female royal race rather than from the male which custom, as is well known, has been observed among the Picts to this day. In process of time, Britain, besides the Britons and the Picts, received a third nation, the Scots, who, migrating from Ireland under their leader, Ruda, either by fair means or by force of arms, secured to themselves those settlements among the Picts which they still possess. From the name of their commander, they are to this day called Delrudens, for in their language, Dal signifies a part. Ireland, in breadth, and for wholesomeness and serenity of climate, far surpasses Britain, for the snow scarcely ever lies there above three days. No man makes hay in the summer for winter's provision or builds stables for his beast of burden. No reptiles are found there, and no snake can live there, for, though often carried thither out of Britain, as soon as the ship comes... As soon as the ship comes near the shore, and the scent of the air reaches them, they die. On the contrary, almost all things in the island are good against poison. In short, we have known that when some persons have been bitten by serpents, the scrapings of leaves of books that were brought out of Ireland being put into water and given them to drink have immediately expelled the spreading poison and assaged the swelling. The island abounds in milk and honey, nor is there any want of vines, fish, or fowl, and it is remarkable for deer and goats. It is properly the country of the Scots, who, migrating from thence, as has been said, added a third nation in Britain to the Britons and the Picts. There is a very large gulf of the sea, which formerly divided the nation of the Picts from the Britons, which gulf runs from the west very far into the land, where to this day stands the strong city of the Britons called Alcluith. The Scots, arriving on the north side of this bay, 
settled themselves there. Chapter 2. Caius Julius Caesar, the first Roman that came into Britain. Britain had never been visited by the Romans and was indeed entirely unknown to them before the time of Caius Julius Caesar, who in the year 693, after the building of Rome, but the 60th year before the incarnation of our Lord, was consul with Lucius Bibulus and afterwards while he made war upon the Germans and the Gauls, which were divided only by the river Rhine, came into the province of the Marini. From whence is the nearest and shortest passage into Britain? Here, having provided about 80 ships of burden and vessels with oars, he sailed over into Britain where, being first roughly handled in a battle and then meeting with the violent storm, he lost a considerable part of his fleet no small number of sword soldiers and almost all his horses. Returning into Gaul, he put his legions into winter quarters and gave orders for building 600 sail of both sorts. With these, he again passed over early into spring into Britain, but whilst he was marching with a large army towards the enemy, the ships riding at anchor were by a temptus either dashed one against another or driven upon the sands and wrecked. Forty of them perished. The rest were, with much difficulty, repaired. Caesar's cavalry was at the first charge defeated by the Britons. And Libinus, the tribune, slain. In the, second en in the second engagement, he, with great hazard to his men, put the Britons to flight. Thence he proceeded to the river Thames, where an immense multitude of the enemy had posted themselves on the furthest side of the river, under the command of Cassibellan, and fenced the bank of the river, and almost all the ford under water with sharp stakes. The remains of these are to be seen to this day, apparently about the thickness of a man's thigh and being cased with lead, remain fixed immovably in the bottom of the river. This being perceived and avoided by the Romans, the barbarians not able to stand the shock of the legions, hid themselves in the woods, whence they grievously galled the Romans with repeated sallies. In the meantime, the strong city of Trinovantum, with its commander, Androgius, surrendered to Caesar, giving him 40 hostages. Many other cities, following their example, made a treaty with the Romans. By their assistance, Caesar, at length, which much difficulty, took Casabellan's town, situated between two marshes fortified by the adjacent woods, and plentiful furnished with all necessaries. After this, Caesar returned into Gaul, but he had no sooner put his legions into winter quarters than he was suddenly beset and distracted with wars and tumults raised against him on every side. Chapter 3 Claudius, the second of the Romans who came into Britain, brought the islands of Orcades into subjection to the Roman Empire, and Vespian, sent by him, reduced the Isle of White under their dominion. In the year of Rome 798, Claudius, fourth emperor from Augustus, being desirous to approve himself a beneficial prince to the Republic, and eagerly bent upon war and conquest, undertook an expedition into Britain, which seemed to be stirred up to rebellion by the refusal of the Romans to give up certain deserters. He was the only one, either before or after Julius Caesar, who had dared to land upon the island, yet within a very few days, without any fight or bloodshed, the greatest part of the island was surrendered into his hands. He also added to the Roman Empire the Orcades, which lie in the ocean beyond Britain, and then, returning to the Rome the sixth month after his departure, he gave his son the title of Britannicus. 
This war he concluded in the fourth year of his empire, which is the 46th from the incarnation of our Lord, in which year there happened a most grievous famine in Syria, which in the Acts of the Apostles is recorded to have been foretold by the prophet Agabus. Vespasian, who was emperor after Nero, being sent into Britain by the same Claudius, brought also under the Roman dominion the Isle of Wight, which is next to Britain on the south and is about 30 miles in length from east to west and 12 from north to south, being six miles distance from the southern coast of Britain at the east end and three only at the west. Nero, succeeding Claudius in the empire, attempted nothing in martial affairs and therefore, among other innumerable detriments, brought upon the Roman state. He almost lost Britain, for under him, two most noble towns were there taken and destroyed. Chapter 4. Lucius, king of Britain, writing to Pope Eleutherius, desires to be made a Christian. In the year of our Lord's incarnation, 156, Marcus Antonius Verus, the 14th from Augustus, was made emperor, together with his brother Aurelius Commodus. In their time, whilst Eleutherus, a holy man, presided over the Roman church, Lucius, king of the Britons, sent a letter to him, entreating that by his command he might be made a Christian. He soon obtained his pious request, and the Britons preserved the faith, which they had received, uncorrupted and entire, in peace and tranquility until the time of the Emperor Diocletian. Chapter 5 How the Emperor Severus divided that part of Britain, which he subdued from the rest by a rampart. In the year of our Lord 189... Severus, an African, born at Leptis in the province of Tripolis, received the imperial purple. He was the 17th from Augustus and reigned 17 years. Being naturally stirred and engaged in many wars, he governed the state vigorously, but with much trouble. Having been victorious in all the grievous civil wars which happened in his time, He was drawn into Britain by the revolt of almost all the Confederate tribes, and after many great and dangerous battles, he thought fit to divide that part of the island, which he had recovered from the other unconquered nations, not with the wall, as some imagine, but with the rampart. For a wall is made of stones, but a rampart with which camps are fortified to repel the assaults of enemies is made of sods cut out of the earth and raised above the ground all round like a wall. Having in front of it the ditch whence the sods were taken and strong stakes of wood fixed upon its top. The Severus drew a great ditch and strong rampart fortified with several towers from sea to sea and was afterwards taken sick and died at York leaving two sons, Bassinius and Geta, of whom Geta died, adjudged a public enemy, but Bassinius, having taken the surname Antonius, obtained the empire. Chapter 6. The reign of Diocletian and how he persecuted the Christians. In the year of our Lord's incarnation, 286, Diocletian the third. 33rd from Augustus and chosen emperor by the army, reigned 20 years and created Maximian, surnamed Herculeus, Herculeus, his colleague in the empire. In their time, one Carotius, of very mean birth, of very mean birth, but an expert and able soldier, being appointed to guard the seacoast then infested by the Franks and Saxons, acted more to the prejudice than to the advantage of the commonwealth. And from his not restoring to its owners, the booty taken from the robbers, but keeping it all to himself. 
It was suspected that by intentional neglect, he suffered the enemy to infest the frontiers. 